Um, was there any last things before we get started? Oh, good. I think yeah. I'm good. All right. Any questions or anything come up, then just feel free to ask. Um, I'm happy to help wherever is needed. All right. The scene's going to open with the three of you walking together. It's late night. And you spent time together. It's up to you guys how long exactly you've known each other. But for whatever the case is, uh, we spent a long time on this road. Days of tromping down the desiccated, dusty paths, the nights spent under the cold, gripping moonlight. Though you've met little resistance, the adventure's been quite loathsome. Your quest takes you to the forsaken and grim city of Amberport, where men, women, and children have long spent their lives under the tyrannical gauntlet of the one they call the Beast, a man of low integrity and little moral. He left this world recently, murdered in his sleep by his own child. And now the city has set about its rebirth. They have need for folk like you, those that wish to clean the streets of the filth, heal the sick, perhaps educate the young. It may not be the best of work, but it is honorable. Mayhaps that what you need in life to calm your troubles and outpace your past. But on this night, a terrible storm has come. The clouds, clouds blot out the sky and this thick, viscous fog chokes out any vision beyond a few feet. The rain pelts the earth like tiny needles in flesh and it runs in rivulets along the body of the ground. In the distance, the yellow lights of the Goat Horn Inn are but an abstract blur that leads you forward through the muck and through the damning weather. And that is where our story begins. A common halfway point between from whence you came and to where you go. A traveler's tavern in the middle of nowhere offering respite from those on the road need it most. Uh, Tim, we can say your character enters first. Why don't you describe what you've been up to and how you enter and what you look like? Well, Vasily, he's, he looks like a normal human, except for the fact that he has two large goat horns growing out of the side of his head. He walks into the inn, the sound of his cloven hooves clomping on the wooden floor. People have finally got used to seeing it, his bizarre face as he was... He's not something that's of, of common descent in this area. But they finally figured out that he wasn't someone that was a threat to any of them. He's, he's spent most of his time quietly reading books on his own, um, examining the flora and fauna of the area, spending time alone in the wood, and just quietly reflecting for a lot of his time. Behind you, I'm just going to cross the bottom of my screen. So, Jesse, why don't you introduce your character and who it is? Sure. Um, as the doorway opens, it, it almost blocks out the outside uh, when Mud ducks his head to work his way into the door, uh, standing a little bit over seven feet tall with a big fur cloak pulled up, uh, hooded cloak pulled up over his head. Uh, once he comes in and pulls the cloak down, He's a, he's a sallow and sunken in gray-skinned orc with long tusk, uh, almost coming up to the bottom of, well, his one eye, because his other eye is covered in a fur-lined patch. Um, as he walks in, he'll take a moment to look all around the room and just kind of grunt at the people in there and work his way over to the table to sit down. Um, He's used to being on the road. He's more uncomfortable the more people are around. But he tries his best not to let it show too much. Nice. And as the two of you step inside, a third figure comes in. Kevin, why don't you go ahead? All right. Uh, Mornak has red hair and gold skin. He's got the pointed ears of an elf. 
Uh, he's wearing a red cloak, uh, fine traveler's clothes under that. And he, uh, he, uh, he's wearing a tricorn hat, one of the, the ones from the, uh, the Renaissance. This decrepit building lies on the edge of a dark forest of pine and evergreens. Mm -hmm. Their branches stretching out over the neglected road like black skeletal hands in this heavy mist that has settled. The only other pair of structures is a small rickety outhouse that reeks of urine and a storage shed whose doors creak and groan in the wind between slams. Inside this modest building proved to be much more welcoming. Well-kept tables fill the main hall and an old old but nicely polished bar rests in the back. A fireplace burns with but a few smoldering embers, the remains of the nightly log, around which two individuals sit in large chairs, speaking softly to one another. One looks to be a younger gentleman, human, perhaps in his mid-twenties, badly scarred face, perhaps of some sort of burn, and a black slicked back mohawk. The other one is a very elderly looking woman with bright, white, thinning hair, who looks to be well into her 80s by now. They offer a soft laugh to one another. Beyond that, there's two others in the far back. A large dwarf with bright red hair and red beard stands behind the counter. At first, it looks like a man, but upon closer inspection, it is indeed a female. And behind her, another female dwarf stands in what looks to be the kitchen doorway. They'll offer a warm smile to you as you enter before turning back to cleaning the dishes and wiping down the counter. And you hear what sounds to be a jovial laugh of a younger man from back in the kitchen area, though he's out of sight. Beyond that, you can see two more doors that lead out to the stables and something in the back side of the building and two hallways on either side that lead to tavern rooms for the night. I tossed a quick map of this place over into the messenger there. What do you guys do? Well, Mornak's going to go over to the bar and he's going to, to find out what there is to drink in this place. Ah, uh, an elf. We ain't got any of that elven swill. You drink beer or you drink ale. Perhaps you would like a stout. Uh, I will take a stout. Thank you. Just a bit of copper. One little piece and... I'll have a trick up for you, laddie. What about your friends? Well, what would they like to have to drink this night? Have you any stew? <sighs> stew. We could uh, perhaps whip you up a batch of something good. Perhaps dump a bit of flour in the soup that we have, thicken it up so it sticks to your ribs. We can do that. As long as it's hot, that sounds quite enjoyable. <laughs> you got it, my friend, my friend. And what of the Sork? We don't see many of your types here. Slam down a, uh, a cup of my own that I pulled out from under my cloak. Looks like it's carved out of bone, almost. That will do. She dumps in this dark amber liquid into your cups. Another for Mornak as she slides it over. Turns towards this kitchen. And, Aye, we need a bit of stew for the newbies. And you hear a, another laugh from this kitchen. You see a younger gentleman peek his head out from around the corner, maybe in his late teens, has a real thinning black mustache and flopper sort of hair, dressed sort of silly clothes, almost jester-like. He'll offer a smile, a toodaloo with his hat, and as he steps back in to make up some food. Uh, this red-headed dwarf will reach her hand across, taking each of yours. The name is Ananda. 
will be yours. Amanda or Ananda? Ananda. Ananda with an M. Indeed. You may call me Vasili. Vasili. Because, because that, well, is my name. I've heard worse names. What about you, Orc? What is your name? <laughs> worse names it is. You may call me Mud. Well, that is a name for an orc. And an elf. Hmm. Perhaps I can guess your name. Is it some sort of Leo win or something with a win? No, it is Mornak. I'm not like other frail elves. I'm my kind of frail elf. <sighs> you have a bit of humor about you. Perhaps I'll come to like you after all. So it brings you down these roads. We are like on a quest. Was... Sorry. It just seemed like the darkest, dankest, muddiest road. There has to be some fun at the end of that road. Ah, indeed, indeed. Not many people pass through here these days. One time, it was quite a lively and bustling place. Now it's just a midway point between the past and the present, the future. But we don't let that get us down, me and my beautiful wife. Come, come, Gelda, meet our new companions. See a other elf that you saw back in the kitchen step out. She has sort of blondish brunette hair, clean shaven, this one though, no less bulky. She'll step out and hurry over. Oh my goodness, I've... I didn't expect to have any more this evening, and I've already put the soup away, but we, we forgot it's warming for you. Um, I, I'll have it all out for the lot of you. And, uh, sorry for the intrusion. Uh, the name is Gelda. Gelda. Indeed, indeed. It's, I can't thank you enough for visiting us here at the Goat's Horn Inn. You'll see this red-haired dwarf look over. Like, ah, I keep telling you, it's not a goat's horn, it's the goat thorn. No, 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 it's, it's a goat's horn. And the two of them begin arguing about the name of the place. Finally, coming to a decision that they will both agree to disagree. Gently, I stroke my ram's horn on the side of my head. I think goat's horn is quite a nice name. That's what I've been telling her, but she doesn't want to listen. She thinks it seems too uh, prissy and promising and... Something about the go thorn, as she says. See, it seems more rebellious, but I don't have any of that. Well, I will enjoy the soup whenever you happen to have it ready. Give me a, just a few moments and I'll bring her right out for you. Bring, bring her right out for you. She quickly scurries back to the back room. You can hear the clanking of pots and pans. Other young man's laughters. He talks, but he speaks in what seems to be a completely different language. None of you are rightly familiar with offhand. Sounds somewhat elfish. You, you can pick out a few words, Mornak, but it's like it's um, mixed in with other languages, like a spattering of different things. Takes him a good 10 minutes or so, but they'll bring out the large bowl of this thickened up soup. Three empty bowls, one for each of you. Some spoons and sets them down. Nanda gives a soft nod. If you need anything, I'll be out and about. I gotta finish buttoning down the place. It's a bitch of a storm we have coming in tonight. Odd. Oh. It wasn't a cloud in the sky before, and here it is now. I expect you'll be staying for the evening. If you have any room. We have a few that are taken, and the old man, it's strange he hasn't woken up yet, so I have to go get him. But one of the noble rooms has been taken. But yes, we have simple cot rooms for a copper or something a bit more fancy for a silver, if it pleases you. Your choice, your choice. Oh, I'm a simple man. A simple cot will do 
Indeed. I cannot even remember the last time we slept with a roof over our heads. Yeah, that in itself is a luxury. One of the fancy rooms, please. Ah, I could have guessed that, couldn't I? She'll slide keys over to each of you. Basic, basic cot room is one copper, the fancy is a silver. If she slides that over to you, Mornak. She says, uh, second door down the hall. The, the first one is taken by an old man, Horvath. We'll have to wake him up shortly. He tends to sleep a bit late for his dinner. So we'll let him snooze for the moment. Go ahead and enjoy your meals. And you'll just let me know if you need anything. So you say the storm just came out of nowhere. Is that something that happens here often? <sighs> To be honest, I can't say it. it is. It's a bit strange. Uh, I was out tending the garden today. Uh, all of our vegetables freshly growing by myself. That is why they're extra tasty. And yeah, not a cloud in the sky. Beautiful. A bit cool for the summer air, but beyond that, it's as if uh, the sky is opened and a fell beast of a storm came through. But it'll pass, it'll pass. Well, fortunately, we found your establishment so we can have a roof. Indeed. And I'll take a spoonful of the soup and then carefully look around the room to see if there's any other people. Only other two is this younger gentleman with the slicked back hair and scarred up face talking to an older woman in her upper 80s, white hair, very old, also human. And both of them sit in these large cushion chairs in front of the fireplace young man will reach forward with a poker stick and jostle the embers a bit and pick up what little bit of flames are still left before sitting back. As he does so, he sort of turns in your direction and black eyes with you for a few moments, silly. Offers a smile and a nod. I, I raise my bowl of soup and a toast and nod back. Does that have soup? He'll lift his ale and Nod back to you as well and take a swig. You can see he leans over and says something to this old woman who smiles and nods to him and gives him a soft hand on the shoulder as if she's saying okay or something of that sort. And he'll set his mug down and make his way towards you. Comes forward. You can see he's of average build, younger, maybe in his mid 20s. Has a uh, sort of a disturbing sort of look to him. Not evil or anything like that, but the scarred face burns that makes you a little uncomfortable at first glance. Can't help but stare at him for a few moments. He'll hold out his hand in greeting. I eagerly grasp his hand. Hello, are you a local here or are you a traveler as well? <laughs> No, no, no. I'm just a bit of a traveler passing through. Came back from Amberport. I'm headed down south. The name is Lyot, and this my dear mother, Verdi. Lyot Luckily, Verdi. came upon this establishment this afternoon and thought perhaps we'd take a rest. She don't get around as well as she used to, of course. Nearly 87 years old. Can you believe it? What a life, what a life. Oh, quite a long life. My name is Vasily. Vasily. Hmm. Well, excellent to meet you. Fawn, I assume. Only met a ah, few you of my you. Kind. Only a couple here and there. Perhaps they often prance about in Amberport. Or at least they used to as slaves of the old lord. Jesters of sorts. But uh, quite a... Uh, Fun folk you often be, right? Yes, quite enjoyable we can be. And an elf, ah, by the gods. Can't say I see many of you around here either. And an orc, strange sort of group we have here. Friends, all friends. You could say we're friends. Or you could not say we're friends. It depends on your point of view. 
But I'll ask the orc then. Be ye all friends? We've traveled many miles together. I guess that makes us friends. Excellent, excellent. Well, perhaps we can all share a drink together and be called friends as well. A clever man could make a, quite a joke out of our group. A fawn, an elf, and an orc walk into a bar. Uh, now, if we only had a punchline. I'll have to think on that. I'm not too I much will of a, as well. I drink not, my bowl. Not too much of a witty man am I, but I can tell a good tale and share a good drink. Why, why don't you let me buy you all around and you're more than welcome to come and join us around the fire. Ananda and yeah. Gelda will be closing up the bar soon, but uh, that don't mean we have to sit in darkness. I look at my group and with a shrug, I stand up and walk over towards the fire. We have nothing better to do. With that, you will slide a few coins across the counter over to this red-haired dwarf. Let her know to bring out a pitcher of ale for everybody. He'll take care of it for the evening. He walks over. Mother, this is our new friends. Silly Monak and Mud. This old woman looks up at you with these gray eyes and offers this warm smile. You can see all of her teeth, though gone, she has them replaced by what look to be wooden dentures that are dark and rather unpleasant looking at the best. Oh, well, you can all join us here around the fire. If you don't mind an old woman snoring on your shoulder, she offers you a smile, Vasily. I just smile back. Come, come. Enjoy the warmth. My old blood doesn't flow like it used to. And I get cold easily, but there's nothing like sitting next to a warm flame watching the embers glow. Is there? So the traveling companions will actually see something they have not seen yet. Uh, Mud will actually have a look of softness on his face for once as he takes his big fur cloak off, uh, revealing a ton of scars down his neck and neck and arms. And he places it over the, uh, the old woman's shoulders. Rest easy, grandmother. Ah, oh, gentlemen, you are perhaps bestial though you look. That's not intended to be an insult, young man. But well. Your kind doesn't have very good reputation from where I'm from, but thank you, Sonny. Thank you. We've never been called good reputation, and we've never been called pretty. No offense taken. She'll pull your cloak around her a little bit tighter and sit back in this big, comfortable chair again. Over the next few minutes, you can see she slowly dozes off a little bit in her chair. Every now and then, waking up to get more comfortable and watch the flames. This other man, this young gentleman, Lyle, sips on his drink. Are the lot of you headed to Amberport? I've heard many people are headed that way. Many such as yourselves looking for new work, new friends, new life. A new life, yes. And I'll raise my glass up. Here's cheers to a new life. Cheers indeed. Black your glass once again, and this time he downs this entire pint that he has and fills up his glass once more. Well, you should know that it's a destitute place that you're headed, but I believe in good time it will. It will rival what it once was in centuries past. Uh, the beast is gone. New government and hold. People like yourselves. Well, if my mother wasn't as sick as she is, I'd be there making a life as well. But she had a 
last wish to visit her family in the south, and I promised with everything I had I would at least get her there one last time. So this new government replacing the beast, is the, is the old boss the same as the new boss, or is this an improvement? Well, I suppose only time will tell. He's a good man, a bar sabor. Bar sabor? Indeed. Seems like a good man, but time will tell. He's tore down most of the old monuments to the beast, and preparing to fix the roads, release the slaves, outlawed much of the slavery and decrepit filth that was there. It'll take time, of course. It's hasn't been long, only a few months, but in the coming years, I believe it'll be it'll it'll be quite the place in the end. I have all faith in the matter. Sometimes faith is all you have. It's good to have a little. Yes, yes. Hail to the new God. It's without him, I don't know where I'd be these days. You know, reach up and sort of stroke the side of his face that's all scarred and burnt. Well, when you hail the new god, you'll see uh, Mud reaches up to one of the scars that's almost in the shape of a, a snowflake on his neck and just kind of rub that when he talks about the new god. As you rub your cheek, you'll feel a rough hand on your shoulder. Look over and you see Ananda, this red haired dwarf. Uh, sorry, didn't mean to startle you, but. Uh, I couldn't help but notice that scar there that you're rubbing on. One of the old faith, I assume? Yes, Father Winter. <laughs> interesting, interesting. Could be, made me survive this long. Well, perhaps you might be able to do me a favor, Mud. There's an old gentleman down the hall. Um, one of the old faith like yourself though he follows the Horned King. But I think all of you have connections through the old beliefs, the old gods. Ah, would you mind uh, waking him up for dinner for me? I'm going to go prepare his meal. But, well, last time he clocked me a good one on the jaw, and well, I thought perhaps you might be able to handle an old man better than I. You can talk about the old faith or something. Yes, I can handle this. Which room is he in? First one there behind the green curtains. She'll point over her shoulder. It's been a little room that's been closed off the green curtains. You can see a door behind it. So be careful though, he has hell of a left hook on him. Hell of a left hook. <laughs> I think I'll be all right. And without hesitation, Mud will get up and just start walking back towards the curtain. And she'll nod, thank you, and hurry over. You can see she gets out a bowl and a glass and starts filling the glass up with some water and puts out a plate of these vegetables that have been cut up. Get to the room. You can see the door is clicked open, just maybe about an inch or so. Um, you can see the glowing of a small candle beyond. Uh Bang on the door slightly. Come, grandfather. It's time for your supper. Inside is but silence. And you'll see Ananda yell over. Ah, he's a bit hard of hearing. He might have to actually go rustle the man. That's why I thought perhaps you would might take it upon yourself. Well, yeah. Rub her jaw again, which you can see a definite little bruise on the corner of her jaw. So be it. Open the door and kind of see where the old man is. Opens up into a nice but uh, fairly plain looking room. You can see a table in the corner lined up with a few of this old man's effects. What looks to be a pouch and a couple books and a candle. Still lit, almost burnt down to the bottom though, just barely flickering. There's a wash bowl set on a small table, a couple of clean rags beside it. One of them has been used and is draped over the side. 
And in the bed, you can see the body of this old man. It flickers just barely in the small candlelight, this uh, orangish yellow glow flickering along his body. Looks to be quite old, if you had to guess. Up in his upper 70s or 80s, just like the old woman out front. Oddly, he lays not on top or under the covers, but instead on top, completely naked from head to toe. Stride over and kick the uh, leg of the bed. Grandfather, wake up. Bedel jostle a little in his formal kind of shift when he hit the bed. But you see his neck and it just kind of flops over to the side. Does not move otherwise. Look a little closer. Um, give me a wisdom challenge roll, or yeah, will challenge roll. Will, so that's just a d20. Yep, and you watch your modifier, and the DC is always a 10. But do you have any professions that would help for some kind of sicknesses or anything like that? No, no, I don't think so. If you do, uh, then just mention it, and then that gives you a boon, which is the 1d6 roll. Yeah, no, I don't think any of my backgrounds or professions would uh, come into play here. I rolled a 17 on the die. Okay. Hit the bed, and you can see his sort of head slumps over a little bit. You look closer. You notice this chest is not moving up and down with the breath. His limbs look a little paler. He's indeed dead. Though, you get the sense it hasn't been overly long, maybe a few hours at best. There's no smell or decay of any sort. But... Is there uh, any other blankets in the room besides for the ones he's lying on? Um, or well, yeah, they'd be like folded up at the end of the bed, like a quilt or something like that. Yeah. Or quietly cover his face, or well, cover him. Say a small prayer to uh, Father Winter, and uh, put out, turn out the candle, blow out the candle, close the door as I head back out. Dwarf. I believe your guest has moved on. Oh, my dears, he was perfectly fine this morning. Well, I guess he is quite old. And... Oh, dear. Well, I guess he won't be eating this anyway. She'll set this plate of vegetables aside. And as you're stepping away from the door, Mud, you can hear your footstep second and as you move forward it's almost this nagging sense in the back of your skull and you stop and by inhibition something the sixth sense maybe and you can hear this <laughs> inside this room footsteps that patter this strange cackling laughter I'll uh, push the door back open and glance in. Um, I do have Shadow Sight as an orc. Okay. So, um, and glance right back to the old man and see if he's still there. He is there, but now he sits up in the bed, crawling forth, pulls himself up onto his knees, up onto his feet, standing on this bed. You can see his skin sags, old, wrinkly, down his body. And he reaches down beside his bed, lifts up a, like a Pope's hat type thing, places it down slowly. And he turns towards you, and you can see the blackness in his eyes. His eye, hunger. I could smell your blood, taste your flesh. Death comes for you, carried by my children, all of my children, that I have sent to end you. They come for you, come to end your miserable, mortal lives. With that, you can see he floats up a foot, about two foot off the bed, and then flies straight towards you. What do you do? I, I'm... I think <sighs> J 
just the shock of all of it, he would go completely defensive and he'd reach up and grab the scar and ice would start forming around. And he, I would try to cast ice armor on myself as I prepare to <laughs> get slammed into. All right. Ice armor. What does that do for you? Yeah, I got to look. I got to <laughs> Two different things up, because uh, that's in two different books. <laughs> Give me one second. What do you? The other um, two? I get a plus two bonus to defense until the spell ends. Um, if I take damage from fire, it ends. Uh, I only take half, and it ends. But I'm immune to cold or ice. Gotcha. All right. The other two of you can hear. This ruckus, you can hear this deep, almost demonic, uh, unnatural voice that speaks to mud in the room. You would have heard what it says. Look over your shoulders. You can see this ice casing go up the orc's body. Maybe you've seen it here and there as he's used a spell in your travels. And you see this body fly forth and slam into the orc. Um, what do the two of you do? Not knowing the, exactly. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was saying, not knowing what's going on completely, I stand up, I wave my hands around, and start casting a spell. And I cast Arcane Shield. Right. Let's see, Arcane Shield and Mornak. What do you do? Mornak's going to do yeah. the same thing, only instead of the shield, he's going to cast Arcane Armor. Yeah, right. Alrighty, in that case, that will be you guys set up turns. So, the way initiative works is you get to choose to go fast or slow. If you go fast, you get one action, which can be whatever. You might, have, you might be able to move, cast a spell, use an item, attack, whatever the case might be. If you go slow, you can move and attack, or take two moves. Or You can't take like two attacks or anything with it, though. It's only the extra move action, basically going slow. So with that said, would you like to go fast or slow? And I go by, you guys can call it as I go down the list or whatever, but I put you already into sort of like an order on my screen, so I'll let you know who goes up when. But in that case, who wants to go fast and who wants to go slow? I'd like how to go slow. Away? How far away is he? Is this? From where you guys are, he's probably about 40 feet behind you. You guys are up at, towards the flame, and he's in the back side of the inn. So Just to get to him, you'd have to move, unless you had something ranged. He's heading right for me, though, right? Correct, yeah. So I'm going to go fast. You could do the Vasili's fast. All right. Mud, what would you like to do? You going fast or slow? Uh, I'm thinking I'm going fast. You said uh, that, so like casting a spell would be? Yep, you can do that as a fast action, yeah. Okay. Basically, unless you want to move too, then you'd want to go slow. But if you don't want to move and you just want to cast, then that's fast. No, so I'm going to uh, I'm going to go fast here. Gotcha. And Mornak, fast or slow? I'm going to go ahead and go slow. All right, gotcha. In that case, let's see. Better agility. Vasile, you are up first then. Okay, I raise my hands up and point my fingers straight at him, and I cast a magic dart. It does 1d3 plus 1 damage. So he takes 4 points of damage. Gotcha. So this glowing dart of energy just leaps from my finger and flies into the old man. You can see these sparks cascade across his body, and he jerks sort of a little bit in the air as he flies forward. His eyes still set upon you for the moment, Mud. And Mud, you are up. As uh, the continue to form around. Oops, you're super, super quiet. Uh, better? Nope. Hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. How about now? Still really quiet. Um, let's see, I can turn you up on my end probably. 
Now say something. How about any better? Yeah, a little bit. All right. I'll, I'll, let me get this through and then I'll, <laughs> I'll figure out what's going on. Um, so I will pull some of the uh, ice forming around me and blast it right into, uh, into him as it's coming towards me. Um, it's a cone three yards long. So he, he can make an agility challenge roll. Um, uh, let's see, agility. He has one bane on that for being a zombie, and he will fail. He would take seven damage, and not that I think it's going to matter, but the uh, area for the large in front of me becomes difficult terrain. Okay. Yeah. Basically, it just sounds like your mic fell or just covered up or like something like that. All right. And he has to go slow, so Mornak, you would be up before the zombie can do anything. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and cast a uh, uh, mind stab on this thing. All right. Let's and see. Let me bring it up. Am I coming through? On so you? I yep. make an intellect attack roll against the target's intellect. On a success, it takes 1d6 plus 6 damage. Hey, that should work. Okay. On his intellect, which you use only a 6. Okay, I got a five. Five That's total. Not very good. Yes. <laughs> yes, not quite good enough. <laughs> I didn't. As you well. try to probe this thing's brain, it's almost like hitting a stone wall. You see, this vision sort of flashes in your own brain of this great towering wall, 60, 70 feet into the air. And these huge iron gates that hang. The sky is but blackness, the ground dark, filled with fog. And it's only this brief flash in your back of your head for a moment, and then it's gone. And the zombie is up. It's going to swing forth and stops just a few inches away from you as it flails out with these long, thin, dirty claws towards you, mud. Um, I need, actually, might as well get everybody's defense real quick so I don't have to keep asking for it. Uh, Mud, what is your defense? Uh, generally, my defense is going to be 15. Um, well, you know, it's still going to be 15 right now. I okay. don't have my shield on me, but I do have the ice tank. Your mic's like all freaking out again on you, though. <laughs> let, me, let me switch out to the other mic. Uh, Mornak, what was your defense? Mine is 12 plus the two from Arcane Armor. So that's going to bring me up to 14. All right. And Vasily, what's yours? I'm 11, but he attacks me with a bane. Okay. Gotcha. So let's see. Uh, better. Yep. Okay. I, I'm just doing away with this other mic. <laughs> All right, so yeah, he's going to swing in these long claws just slashing the way towards you, Mud. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Oh. And of course, I'm going to roll a quick for a crit first thing on you. And 14, 18 will hit you. So, six. Going to take six points of damage total. This thing lunges in, and you can feel these claws. They glow with sort of this obsidian sort of darkness to them, this bluish-purple light around them, sinking right through whatever armor you might have through this ice coating that you have. And where they touch your flesh, they leave these large, black, open wounds. And I need a strength challenge from you with one bane. 
All right, so. Okay, I rolled a natural 20 on the d20, a 5 on the bane, and then I add, well, my strength to 12, so I plus don't know two. what I... You would add plus 2. It's plus just 2, three. okay, so it's anything over 10 is the... Yep. Okay, so 20 minus 5 is 15, 17 total. Totally good. You are good. You can see your knees weaken a little bit, but you withstand this blow. And it'll hover back a few inches away from you and just begin laughing hysterically. You can see its teeth that it has in its mouth rot and fall out in front of you. And they hit the floor in splatters of blood. You can see bits and pieces of his skin begin to peel away. And with that, it would be the end of the round. Do, do, do. Who would like to go fast? Vasily will go fast. Gotcha. I'm assuming I'm going fast because I'm going to move out and to go get my shield and my weapon. Move back into the main room. All right. Um, you... Uh, well, you can go fast, and if you move away, he's going to basically get an attack on you for not disengaging. Or you could go slow, disengage, and then move. Oh, okay. Uh, gotcha. Um, yeah, so I will uh, I'll go slow. I'll disengage and move away. All right. And Mornak, fast or slow? Mornak is going to go fast this time. Gotcha. Let's see. Um... In that case, Mornak, you are up first. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and do a unerring darts, and I'm going to go ahead and raise my hands, begin moving them in arcane symbols, and then uh, seven bolts are going to jump out from my hands and speed towards the zombie. Is it attack rolls, or do I got to make a save? Seven magic darts fly from your fingertip, divided as you choose among targets. Each dart automatically hits, provided there is an unobstructed path between you and the target. The target takes one damage for each dart. So seven total. Cool. Gotcha. All right. So each of these bolts will land one right after another, smashing into this thing. You can see it blows off part of its shoulder and this arm falls to the ground. The lower half of its jaws blow one apart. Other ones smash into its chest and legs, just blowing bits of old rotting meat off of it. Even though he didn't look this old and decayed and everything a few moments ago. It seems like with each passing moment is just getting worse and worse as the zombie rots. He is still alive. Vasily, you are up then. Well, being disturbed by this condition that he's in, I figure the best thing to do is to take him out as quickly as possible. And I, as I start casting a spell, wisps of shadow form around my hand as I, and I reach my hand out this, this bolt of, sh of pure shadow darkness just leaps from my finger. I have to make an agility attack, or an intellect attack against his agility. His agility is a 9. Right, so I rolled a 12 total. You get it. So yep. he's going to take... Let me double check. So he takes 10 points of damage, and he makes any perception challenge rolls of three banes. All right. Well, that will take him out anyway. Okay. Is this shadow-like bolt wraps around his body. You can see bits and pieces of it just turn into this rotting blackness, and his whole body will hit the ground. And just those few feet that it falls, it just splatters rotten meat, maggots, vermin across the floor. Well, that was disconcerting. Left quite a mess behind. Indeed, and I eagerly go up and start examining the remains of his corpse and see if it looks like he's rotting even further away. It just turns into this disgusting 
goop, but as you look it over, you see that it slowly just begins to dry up, deteriorate, turn to dust on the floor uh, within a few moments. I go into his room and just look around, see if I see anything untoward in there. Um, you see his bed where he was lying. What? It's almost like his shadow was left on the bed. There's this imprint that's sort of darkened of where he laid. <clears throat> Beyond that, there's a few things on the table. You can see a small pouch. If you open it up, it has six copper pieces in it and one silver. You can see a prayer book of the old faith that has all different prayers of the different gods. A particular section of the Horned King has been outlined, says, you know, that's what he was following. And there's a rolled leather strip. It looks kind of like a scroll or parchment, but it's made of leather that's been rolled up. And it's tied with a small bit of leather wrapped around it. When you unroll that, you can see that it's all sorts of strange markings. It looks like something magical in nature. Well, carefully, I put my hand to my head and reach my other hand up, and I cast Sense Magic and try to detect magic in the room. Um, Any lingering magical effects? There's a slight bit of um, necromancy left, but it seems to be sort of just in the air itself, lingering about uh, quite... Perhaps at one time it was quite powerful, but there's more, not much left of it now. And then this leather scroll thing has this uh, necromantic uh, glow Aura. as well. Yeah. Oh, okay. I just, I carefully look at it and examine it. Give me an intellect roll. Do you have any professions that could help? Um, academic magic. Yep, that'll work. So give yourself one boon as well. So I rolled... Um, ten exactly. Okay. I rolled two it's, uh, plus five. Or, yeah, yeah, ten exactly. Exactly what it is, you're not sure. It looks like some sort of ritualistic incantation, far beyond what you are familiar with or have encountered yourself. Um, but it looks as some sort of blood-based ritual. Um, you can see different things mentioning it needs a blood sacrifice and something about uh, protection and uh, eternal sleep. Oh. Absent-mindedly, my forked tongue flips out of my mouth, and I pick it up and, and roll it up, and I put it in one of my pockets. It also makes mention you'll be able to pick out a name called Old Knock. Old Knock? Yep. Seems to mention multiple times. What does Mud and Mornak do during all of this? Mornak's going to stay back out of the way and wait to see what uh, what happens and whether there's any other creatures like this. And so he's just going to touch his forehead like this with his psychic energy and just... Uh, Stand ready. I think after a couple of seconds after the uh, creature goes down and people start moving on, Mud's going <clears> to <throat> let his composure slip a little and crush the skull of the old man with his boot. It'll crunch underneath this orcish foot of yours. As you gather up this little bit of scroll, silly, and tuck that into your vest, mud crushes the skull beneath his feet. More neck, you'll notice the others outside, or you know, the other people inside the building here. But outside of this tavern, the storm continues unrelentlessly. It's hard to see anything through the pelting rain and dire mist, but there is movement. Ananda will step over to the windows first, looking out. 
Galda will come up and put her arm around her as well, and they both of them begin looking out this window. Why all this burned faced young gentleman stands as well at a window? You can hear this young lad in the back kitchen was singing and sort of laughing to himself in the beginning, but after this whole debacle, he's went completely silent out in the kitchen. You can just hear the clanging of pots and pans. Verity, this old woman, sleeps contently for the moment in her chair. But outside, uh, Mornak, you'll notice at first being out in the main room there, as you see what the others are looking at. Celia and Mud, as you two come out into the room, you'll see the others looking out the windows. It's almost as if the mist, the mist itself is alive, groaning, weeping, driven by some sort of hunger. A streak of lightning, a flash through the sky. For a brief moment, it lights up the sludge-caked road and the forest beyond. And it is that moment that you see them, the horde of undead. Tens, twenty, maybe fifty or more. More still coming through the trees. They drip with wet earth and reek of death. Their wails echo through the walls, bringing pity and despair. Limbs hang from their rotting muscles. Bowels drag like tendrils through the mud. Moving from window to window, it's apparent that the dead come from the forest all around, through the mist, and seem to be converging here on the Goat's Horn Inn this evening. They drag themselves across the outside walls, press their leering faces against the windows, smearing gore and muck. Ananda will step back and sort of press Gelda back as well before she slams the inside shutters and drops a latch closing them. You can hear the window on the other side shatter and these rotten fingers poke through the slats of the shutter. Fat little purple maggots. I need will challenge rolls from everybody, please. Can I do that with a bane? Negative one. <laughs> Will mighty twelve. You two are good, but Vasily, you can feel your stomach drop out as your ears lie flat and your knees quake a little bit. You're gonna be take one point of insanity and frightened for basically three rounds. Um, we're not in any sort of initiative thingy, so I just let you know when you're unfrightened, basically. Okay. Um, well, I'm I'm going to frantically start trying to load my crossbow. Ananda and Gelda quickly run around, slamming the inside shutters and latching them. You can see this young gentleman step out of the kitchen for the first time, and his eyes are wide. He's like, the, 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 "There's people outside. They, they tried to bite me." And he runs back into the kitchen. You can hear the slamming of pots and pans, and he comes back out a huge carving knife in one hand and this big black pot in the other that he's sort of holding like a shield. So what, what, what are we going to do? What, what, what are we going to do? We, we can't just let them people in here. They're not very nice people. I, I don't think they like us very much. Is there an attic? Is there an attic? He'll look around, looks over at Ananda and Gelda. But no, that, we got a bit of a root cellar out back, but you need to go outside to get to it beyond that. And if you do look up, you can see that it is a pitched roof and just an open with rafters. I'm going to head towards the back of this place, see if, there's a, if they're surrounding from that side as well. As you move your way around, maybe in some of the side rooms, the back kitchen area, and look at all the windows. Um, Ananda and Gelda as well help you guys close up the shutters or whatever. She shuts the door. She takes up this peg tag lock and puts it on the door itself. But yeah, every window you go to, you can see these undead humans, noids, whatever. Mixture of everything, really. It looks like all different races. Just dragging themselves through this mist, through the muck, towards this place. Some are already up, smearing their faces on the windows, clawing at whatever little openings or gaps between the logs there is. Let's 
seems we are surrounded. Is there a way up onto the roof? I don't think those things could climb. Give me a perception check. Basically. Perception. What's my perception? 13. Uh, dirty 20. Beautiful. You say that, and you look outside, and you can see, crouched in trees, more of these creatures, some with these bony-like protrusions from their back, some with leathery-like wings, others angelic, but like ravens, black as night. And Nanda will sort of look at you, and she looks like she's getting ready to say something until she follows your gaze through this window before she slams it shut. Well, I don't know if the roof's the best of bets if they can fly, too. Oh, this is not good. Not good. You, 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 you're here telling me those people aren't very nice out there. He tried to bite me. I pull that. I, I frantically pull that scroll out again and start looking through it again, see if there's any in, information on there. I'm trying to gauge if this might be summoning them, based upon what's written on there. Or um, just... no, you don't get the sense that you get the sense that this, it does mention things about undead and this old knock, um, but it doesn't look like it's any sort of summoning or. Um, a trajectory form or anything like that. It doesn't seem to be something that's in relation to them being there. At least it's not like a summoning type thing or something like that, no. Or they don't seem like they're coming for it. Okay. But it does seem to have a reference to a lot of undead and some sort of blood ritual. I, I go back into the room and I look to see if there's any signs of a ritual casting, like any blood circles or anything. Uh, I flip over Perfect. Just looking everywhere. Yes. So you can hear the pounding on the walls outside from the undead, and you can hear the shattering of different glasses around as they start poking, trying to get through this shuttered door or shuttered windows. Glass. As you flip the bed and push it out of the way a little bit, underneath of it, you indeed do see what looks to be a rune that's been carved into the floor. Looks like it's dug with a blade of some sort, this necromantic symbol. You've seen it before. It seems to be a protection of some sort, some sort of abjuration-based uh, protection from a dead sort of thing. Um, it's been carved into the floor. It's all been outlined and with this uh, pinkish colored salt. And it looks like blood has been poured into this, the grooves that has been carved down, but it's well beyond dried, and it looks like it was done a long, long time ago. Uh, th this looks like a protective room. And I stand in the circle. Warnak will rush into the room to take a look at this room. Um, give me an intellect check, Mornak. Um, give yourself a boon if you have something related to magic knowledge of some sort of profession. I have academic folklore. Um, that would work. And I also have academic literature. Uh, folklore would be right on. Okay. Does that give me a boon? Yep. So it's 1d20 plus your modifier plus whatever you get on the 1d6. Where are the modifiers at in the book? I could never... Never managed to figure that out. So it's 10 is an even, 10 is a basically your plus zero. Um, okay. For every one above, it's a plus. So like 11 is plus one, 12 is plus two, 13 is plus three, and so on. And then down, it's a negative. So nine is minus one, eight is minus two, seven is minus three, on down. Okay. So this is intellect, so it'll be at a plus two. Yep. That's six. So that's going to be an A11. Um, look at this rune as well. And while you're not as familiar with maybe the necromantic aspects and, and the spell tradition of that sort, you can see it's definitely an old faith folk-based uh, magical um, uh, 
ruin or ritual that's been carved into this floor. Um, you get the same sense of something of some protective relation or something of that sort. But you also see small markings uh, of sacrifice, blood, and what's related to uh, it's called ever sleeping. This is trying to put something back to rest. We need to figure this out. These shutters will not hold for long. See a couple of the ones you're next to shake violently, these hands pulling through. Geldo will quickly run over and smack them out of the way. Is the circle complete or is it broken? Uh, it's carved. In, the salt and stuff that's around it looks like it's quite old and that's pretty much broken, but the ruin itself is carved solid into the floor. And yeah, it looks completely good. Is it like just any normal salt? Uh, the salt that's there it looks like some sort of pinkish, heavy grain salt. But Do you have any salt? I need to read. I think if, if, if we were to redo this circle, we might be able to. I don't know. I'm just, I'm grasping at straws. Warnock pulls his glove off his hand, takes his dagger out, pricks his finger, and dips some uh, some blood into the middle of this rune to see what happens. So, Gelda will quickly run out back and ask for salt, and you can hear her clanking around out there. As this small little driplet of blood from your fingertip drops down, it'll splatter in this rune. It's just a small flash of red and this little bit of smoke that goes up is it seems like it just like a drop of water in a flame sort of thing but it smoked mm -hmm. i believe the magic here is intact and we just need to uh elicit a response from it Geldo, come in. I, I've got a bit of salt here. She'll just sort of hand over this heavy bowl filled with white, basically, kosher salt, basically. Mornak will take the salt and begin uh, redoing the, the circle surrounding it, surrounding the room. Uh, at this point, I think Mud's going to stroll in to see what's going on here <laughs> and uh so it's the three of us and the cook in the room right now yes Gelder. i'll block the doorway so the cook can't leave right now Gelder will stand off the side sort of watching out in the main area ananda continues to make sure all the shutters are at least clasped you can see she goes behind her counter and pulls out this pretty Nasty looking dwarven war axe that she kind of slings up onto her shoulder. None of them bastards will be getting my end this evening. Take them all with me. Die or not. She, sort of takes, I'm sorry. she takes sort of this um, guarded stance in front of the bar. Go ahead. Where are those other two? The, the, the man and the old woman, Liar and Verde. Lyle seems to be standing over next to this younger gentleman who you've heard the others call him Bester. And the two of them seem to be just sort of standing side by side next to um, Ananda up by the bar. Neither one looking uh, particularly pleased, neither one looking any sort of uh, like they have much combat training of any sort. Verdi has covered up tighter in the cloak. You can see Lyle's pulled her chair back away so it's not anywhere near the walls or anything and sort of has it in front of him. So he's behind her, sort of protecting her, kind of like looming behind her. She's awake, and she just kind of sits there, shaking, looking around. Oh, dear. What's going on, Lyle? Set his hands on her, so he's like, it's okay, Mom. We're going to get through this. Just just see what the others have to say. So I'm just I'm just examining them, see if they might have some ulterior motive or anything, see if they're hiding anything. Um, give me a will challenge roll. A will challenge? Yep. Uh, so that would be a 10. Um, neither neither the old woman, Lyle, or um, the young kid, Bester, seem to have any sort of 
three motive that you can tell and they don't give off any signs of it or such them. Bester looks like he's just completely scared shitless at the moment and Lyle seems to be more worried about his mother constantly trying to make sure she's warm and protecting her the best that he seems capable of. He looks a little confused and unsure what to do really. Well, maybe this blood magic needs more blood. And I'll take my knife and I'll, I'll slip my arm, not my wrist, but just like on the meat of my arm. I'll rub my hand in it, and then I'll go to the room and just slap my hand right into the middle of it. At, at this stage, do I recognize this ritual or this carving as uh, something from the old gods? Yes, you do. Uh, exactly. Probably be more of something along like uh, father death or something along those lines. But it's not, you don't get any sense of evil coming from it. All right, so let's see, you're gonna get the blood. Um, in that case, I'm just gonna go down my list here. So as you cut your arm, Vasily, and start smearing the blood around this room, you can see that it starts to glow a little bit as Mornak finishes laying out the salts. It seems to be getting it active or something. Um, do you do anything else, Mud? Out front, you can see Ananda and Gelda pushing tables and chairs up against the walls, sort of making an impromptu defense of some sort. Quickly, they begin busting down these um, shutters, though, and you can see the undead starting to pull themselves through. How, how big is this circle? Oh, I'm sorry. How, how big is this circle? Like, how many people? Yeah, that's what I'm <laughs> um, The ruin on the floor, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, about a two foot in diameter. Oh, all right. Yeah. What do we need? Do we do we need more blood? And I'll look at the uh, the cook that's still in the room with us. <laughs> um, so as you begin to smear your blood on this facility, give me a will challenge roll. But first, do you have an old faith profession of any sort? Nope. All right. Chief or merchant academic. All right, cool. It's just a basic will challenge roll then. I was, I mean, am I going to make it with a bane for my skittish? Um, yes. You, you, uh, you will, you'll have, because you're frightened, you're going to have a bane on it, but you're not going to get another because of skittish. Oh, okay. So that is a seven. Get to smear your blood around this thing, and it glows. The soft reddish light and it begins to burn away. Um, you can tell from what it looks like. You're going to need more blood. More blood for the sacrifice. I look at everyone with, with my bloody knife and my bloody hand. But quick, we need more blood. Do something. Everyone must must offer up some blood for the sacrifice. And with that, Mornak uh, takes his dagger, runs it across his hand, and then is dripping it down onto the rune. And then uh, Mud will take off the glove on his left hand, revealing uh, he's got five fingers, but two of them are just blackened and basically dead looking already. And he'll bite the smallest one off and start pouring the blood in. Everybody give yourself. 1d3 damage. You can roll just 1d6, cut it in half, and let me know how much damage you take. Three. That makes sense. <laughs> I took two. And two for me. Gotcha. All right. Out front, Gelda and Nanda just shove all the tables up and they flip them up on end. And you can see Gelda has a 
where Nanda has this uh, hammer in one hand and these pittons in the other, where she just smashes them through each table, covering up what doors and windows they can. And do, 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 as you bite off your finger and pour the last bit of blood over this uh, ruin, it glows with this dark red crimson light and flares awake. Only frinks open for just a few moments before it starts to die back down. Out in the main hall, you can hear the smashing of windows, the screams of Lyle and Bester, and the cries of this old woman. And as all of you look up from this ruin and look out the door into the main room where they're all at, you can see Verity shakes uncontrollably and she clutches it at the side of her face. She's not bleeding. It doesn't look like she has a wound, but she steps up from her chair that she's in. And as she turns towards you, you can see blood just pouring down out of her nose, across her lips, and down her chin to splatter on these open floorboards. She stumbles forward and tries to catch herself on a windowsill, but smashes into it instead. Several wooden slats crack, burst apart, and before she is able to pull herself away, a rotten clawed hand grasps at her hair. With this gurgled scream, she's pulled forward, slammed into the shutters once, twice, a third time, and you can see her body start to go limp. Lyle will rush over, smashing, trying to cut at these hands with a small chef knife that he has, and trying to pull her away. And with this gurgled scream, she's pulled forward once again, and this time it smashes through the wooden slats, through this broken glass that shatters, and you can see the blood just gush down the windowsill as her stomach is ripped open from the shards of glass. Lyle will step back, just screaming as he watches this horror. Bester, this younger, gestury sort of gentleman that was in the kitchen, drops on the floor and just begins smacking at his head. Outside, you can see the undead pull this old woman through the window, leaving bits of her flesh still stuck to the glass, across the ground outside, and they just defend or descend upon her in a horde. The last thing you see before nothing is her hand reaching up, just pleading for somebody to help her. This zombie will come back and grab a hold of her wrist before chomping down on her fingers, and then she's covered in a swarm of them. But with that, I need a will challenge roll from Mud, please. You can give yourself one boon, because I know you have the old faith thing there. Uh, uh, oh, seven total. Well, that's not good. No. What did you do? Through this open, shattered window, you see one of these flying zombie-like creatures just smash through and land on the floor. It kind of skids across the floor, coming to a stop. Behind it, five more zombies start pulling them through, self through the windows, tearing apart at the side boardings and busting in five zombies and one, we're going to call it a gargoyle, but it's more like a flying zombie. Who would like to go fast? Uh, I would. Flood is fast. Gotcha. Mornak and Vasily, what would you guys like to do? Fast or slow? Fast. Gotcha. Mornak. Fast. Fast as well? All right, let's see. In that case, Mornak, you are up first. You're in the room, and you can see this ruin flash with life as you pour this blood onto it. The little bit that comes from Mud's hand dribbles down on there, and as Vasily continues to smear his arm across this, you hear these high-pitched, painful screams coming from the room out front. And what little bit of blood is on this ruin just goes up in this flash of smoke the smell of burnt flesh and hair, things at your nose, and then the whole ruin just goes black, like caked in soot. But out front, 
you see three of these zombies just burst into flames and crumple to the ground. So there's two zombies left, one regular and one flying zombie. What would you like to do, Mordak? Can I see it well enough to do a magic dart on it? Yes. Okay, that's what I'm going to do is I'm going to do magic dart. All right. Um, the flying one or the regular one? Um, the regular one. Gotcha. Do, 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 do. Um, is that an attack on it, or do I need to make a save? Um, one d three plus one damage. It automatically hits. Yes, it does. That's going to be two points of damage. Gotcha. The start smashes into the side of it, and it sort of jerks back a little bit. And the eyes will twist towards you, Mornak, and it's just pits of blackness behind its eyes. Give me a will challenge roll to not be frightened. That is going to be a five. five. So you are going to be frightened for two rounds. Vasily, you are frightened as far as mechanically is gone. All right. Next up would be Vasily. Um, I am. I'm just going to reach out, and also I'm just going to fire a bolt of, of arcane energy at him, and it's, he's going to take the same broken down almost the wingless one. He's going to take three points of damage. Gotcha. And mud, you are up. I'm not frightened or anything from that. Will? Um. Nope. Not yet. Okay. Yet. Um, so it's still the two of them in front of us? Yep. One fly type one and one regular one. I'm going to uh, turn to the, towards the flying one with the hand that now has three fingers and a thumb. Point two fingers towards them. Spit out my finger at them. And then cast fork lightning. It'll actually go against both of them. Okay. Uh, so I have to make a will attack roll against its agility. Do, 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 do. Agility right. is nine. So 13 for the flying one and 14 for the uh, other one. Gotcha. Both hits. So eight on the flying one and five on the other one. Nice. And five on the other one. Both of them will stutter a step, and then you can just see this forked lightning reach out. They'll stand up straight, their bodies vibrating from the energy that courses through them. The one without wings will shudder a step and then fall down on its knee. You can see part of its chest has been blown out. Its limbs dangle sort of awkwardly. But it continues to slow gait across the floor. The zombie one will pick itself up and almost animal-like scrapples across the floor directly towards mud. Um, the regular zombie shambles forward and grabs a hold of Wile. <coughs> Excuse me. You see its hands grasp on one of his shoulder, another one around his side as it reaches in, its teeth tearing at his shoulder. He lets out this scream of pain as he begins stabbing behind him with this knife that he has in his hand. It's this thing's face. The flying one scrabbles across the floor. And then just a claw attack. And actually, I need a strength challenge roll from you, Mud, with one bane.
and I'm muted. Uh, dirty 20 minus 3, so 17. All right. So as this thing grabs a hold of you, you're able to rip free of it before it's able to sink its claws into you and then get a good grip. But its claws still sink in a little bit, and its teeth gnash forward. The claws are going to miss you, but its teeth just graze the side of your arm as you're pushing this thing off of you. Take one point of damage, and I need a strength challenge roll. Straight up? Yep. Dirty 20 again. All right. In that case, zombies are done. That would be the end of the round. And who would like to go fast? I'll go. I'll see the eagles fast. Gotcha. So Mornak will go slow. Mornak slow. Gotcha. Are they within medium range or long range? Uh, medium. Okay. And mud, fast or slow? Fast. And fast. Uh, the one that's remaining would be a lot short range with me, right? That piece right in front of your face. Yep. Uh, and let's see, everything set. So, Vasily, you are up first then. Okay, so I start moving my hands around in front of me like a, like a puppeteer pulling strings, and this ghostly spectral hand starts floating in front of me, and it launches out at that, at that winged. I'm dead creature. And I roll uh, 14 plus 2 is 16 to hit. That'll be a hit. Okay, he takes two points of damage and, and he has a bane on his next for one round on his attack rolls. So it just it just clutches at his heart, just holding on to him. Is that the, okay. uh, that was the flying the wing, one, right? Yeah, the winged one. He's got a bane. Gotcha. All right, and then Mud, you are up. I'm gonna, while he's biting at my arm, just gonna push him back and reach around, and grab my flail, and bring it down on him. All right, let's see. Defense on this guy is 12. So, for a melee with this, it would be my strength, right? Yep, 1d20 plus your strength. Modifier. Uh oh. Nine. Not quite. So your flail comes around. Nice. It'll slam into the shoulder of this thing, but it just completely crushes the arm part of it right off. It's just almost like a knife through hot or hot knife through butter. It doesn't even really seem to phase this creature. It just knocks off the entire arm into the splattering of gore. But the creature itself doesn't give two craps. Gotcha. And that would be the end of fast. Uh, Mornak, you are up before the zombies. Okay, Mornak is going to go ahead and move into the uh, the room so that he can see the zombies. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I'm going to go ahead and do another unerring bolt. Uh, the for regular zombie or the flying zombie? The flying zombie. Gotcha. For two points of damage. This bolt will slam into the back of this creature since it's face to face with mud. And you can see it lurch forward mud and just the part of its chest blows out, spreading this gore, old rotting intestines across your own chest. And with that off to the side, you will see Ananda come in behind this zombie that's on back of Lyle and she grabs a hold of the thing and just rips it off of him. She has this very barbaric, uh, frenzied look on her face. And these tattoos that are scrawled underneath her eyes and across her forehead seem to glow with this sort of greenish tint to them. She'll throw it to the ground and with a swift kick just smash it in the head with her boot. The thing will scrabble on the ground trying to pick itself up. On the other side, this flying zombie still continues to scrabble at you, Mud, trying to get a hold of you. Once again, I need a strength challenge roll with one bane to not get grappled by it. Okay. Strength? 18 on the... 14 total. All good there. So let's see. It just... Do, do, do. 
just its bite is on its hands, which is going to be a miss. So again, it just snatches its jaws, snapping at your face, trying to get a hold as you shove it away. Once again, its teeth will graze your arm, but not to be able to sink in this time. And then all of you can hear this laughter in the distance. It seems like it comes from everywhere around you. It's, <laughs> and then you hear this, this sound sort of like scraping of wood on metal. It's just a, like, like nails across the chalkboard almost in the distance. And the small sconces cast around this room all go dark. The chandelier of candles hanging from the ceiling goes black. And the small fireplace itself too goes dark as you're left in darkness. Unless you have, I think all of you do might have Shadow Sight or Dark Vision or one of the two. But um, I do. You do? I do. Okay. I'm pretty sure, does the phone? Oops. You muted. Tim. I'm sorry. I'm um, muted. Yeah, I have Shadow Sight. Okay. Um, you guys won't take it, but um, it would be one bane if you didn't on all your rolls if you don't have anything, but you guys are good. Do, 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 do. And that would be the end of the round. Um, you can see this zombie, this flying one that's on top of you, but it's looking pretty bad, as well as this other one that Hananda's kicking over in the corner. Both of them not looking good as well. Um, Gelda has tried... Have you let her... She's trying to get past you in the doorway, Mud. Would you let her go past? Gelda's the... Uh, the cook lady there. Cook. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, she'll just... You can just feel a shove against you. She shoves past... And you can see her, Ananda, Ananda. She runs forward, and she'll grab uh, this hammer that was on the floor that she was using to stake the tables to the walls. And she picks it up and rushes forward to bash at this creature on the ground in front of him. Over in the corner, Bester's on the ground, still just smacking at his head. And Lyle stabbing away at this zombie that sits his feet too, almost in vengeance for what happened to his mother. And... New round. Are there any more coming through? Not yet. They seem to be finishing off their meal outside of the old woman. But yes, the door or the window has not been blocked yet. So I have two quick questions before the next round. Sure. Does the symbol on the ground still look like it's doing anything? Uh, it does not. It does not. Okay. Then my other question. <laughs> It went into effect, burnt out, and burnt up some of the zombies. Yep. And, all right, fast or slow. I am going to go... I'm going to go slow. Gotcha. Okay. I'm going to go slow. Ready? Well, before... Can I ask something first? Yeah. Would you say that they're in an area obscured by shadow or darkness? Yes, definitely. Okay, okay. Then I'll go slow. All right. I'm going to see the slow and mud. Fast or slow? I'm going to go uh, slow. Slow as well? All right. So everybody's slow. Fast run goes past. Um, out front, technically, Ananda and Geldo and Lyle would be going fast, but they're just beating the shit out of the zombie on the ground, which they might take out. Let's see. They do not. They continue just hacking at this thing on the ground. Bits and pieces of it's flying off. It's more like mush, but you'll notice that as they sever limbs and pieces of it, the hand still crawls across the ground, grabbing a hold of the dwarf's foot, and the head still gnashes its teeth. And with that, Mornak, you are up first. Okay. <clears throat> I'd like to go ahead and get out my quarterstaff. And then for my movement, I want to run up behind this winged man um, that's facing mud. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to go ahead and use my staff to try and attack that one. All right. Oh, that's the winged one. Its defense is 12. Hey, I do not think I'm going to hit with a 10. Uh, 1d20 plus your strength modifier. 
Uh, that's negative one since it's a <laughs> nine. So no, you do not yeah. swipe at this thing. And it just, maybe you still hit it in the side or something, but it just sinks into this rotting flesh and doesn't even phase the creature in the slightest. Uh, Vasily, he would be up next. So with my hooves clattering against the wooden floor, I, I run out towards it in a rare display of bravery. And as I'm running, this sh shadowy blade forms in my hand. A, a blade just made out of darkness. It's even darker than the darkness around it. I, I attack with a, a nightfall blade. All right. So seeing him come to my aid, I'd actually like to use my triggered action to uh, for a quick prayer to yeah. Father Winter and provide a boon to that. Yes. All right. So you can boom. have a boon to that roll as well. We'll see. Okay. So uh, it's 14. And it gets to 12. Yeah, 12. So, yep, you hit. Okay. And since so I do 1d6 damage. And since it's in an area obscured by shadow of darkness, it does an additional d6 damage. So it does um, eight points of damage. This shadow blade, you sever off one of the limbs or wings from the back, the skeletal like wing <laughs> shatters on the floor, and dig the blade again deep into its back, just dragging it down the corpse of this thing. It opens it up, and it screams this high pitched wail. And inside, uh, mud, as it opens its mouth from the scream, you can see in the back of its throat, this looks like a chunk of old knotted wood. Uh, let's see, the Sully is done. So, Mud, you would be up. This thing's still alive, barely hanging down in front of you. Do I, uh, do I recognize that, like the old knotted, the, the wood? Um, I, you have, well, you can give me an intellect check if you would like. All right, would my religious devotee give me a boon? Yeah, I'll give it to you in this case. So, dirty 20. Oh, no. Uh, 19. 19. Um, it seems like you've heard of something like this before. You can't, you can't place it's what it is or where it is, but... There's, there's this nagging aspect that you know something, like you should remember something about this. But immediately with the situation at hand, it, it just doesn't click. I think uh, staring at that for a second and then remembering he's right there, but will just take his free hand and grab the jaw and uh, cast shock. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a <sighs> attack against the agility. Not wearing any metal by any chance, is he? He is not. Um, agility is only a nine. Yeah, that's a big natural one. <laughs> With this shock of electricity courses down your arm and then just fizzles out to a little puff of static shock. Like you've been rubbing your slippers across the floor, but it doesn't seem to phase the creature in the least. Do, do, do. And let's see. You can see this zombie out in the main room that the dwarves and Lyle have been hacking on, trying to tear apart one of its hands off to the side. It's been severed off this entire arm, but it'll scrabble across the floor quickly. And you see it crawl up the back leg of Lyle's pants across his back and then wrap around his throat. He'll quickly grab it this thing, trying to pry it away. As it's locked down, as he stumbles back and then falls on the floor, trying to get it off as he begins choking. Ananda smashes her blade once more down on the skull of this creature. A splattering of old brain and muck smears across the floorboards. You'll see Gilda look up at Ananda as Ananda looks down at this smear that she just created. And Gilda's eyes go wide. And right behind her, you can see what looks to be this long spiked branch of a broken tree limb come flying through the window that's been shattered open. Gelda will, you can see she looks at this and for that's almost that slow motion sort of sense and she looks at this flying limb branch and it's Hananda's there and then you see her leap forward as she's impaled on this flying piece of branch 
goes through her chest and tears out the other side in the splattering of blood before the limb itself scatters across the floor, comes to a stop. Seeing Nanda slowly look up and look over her shoulder, it's her partner who is on the ground. Her chest just completely opened up one solid hole, completely done and dead. And with that, end of the round. Who would like to go fast? I see they go fast. 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 Mornak's fast. fast. All right. So let's see. Mornak, you are up first then. Um, out in the main room, you can see Bester again. He's just crying on the ground, smacking his head and making these wailing sounds. You get the sense that he's not fully there, a bit handicapped in the uh, brain a little bit. Gelda's just a uh, dwarf with a huge hole in her chest. And Hernanda looks over top of her. Lyle's on the floor trying to grip at this choking hand that's around his neck. Warnak's going to go ahead and take the staff and once again try and attack the uh, the winged one that's on mud. Yeah. Hey. And that's going to be a 17 to attack. That'll hit. And let me see. Is my damage on that? 1d6 plus 1. Uh, if it's plus 1, you're going to take it out, thanks. It only has two hit points. So describe what you do to it. Sorry about that. My volume went nuts on me. What was that? So, with that, you will take it out because it only has two hit points anyway. So, you can describe how you kill it, what you do. All right. Uh, Warnak takes the staff in both hands, puts the staff around the, the neck of this thing, pulls, and just pulls the head clear off. In a feel this neck, it's jugular, what's left of its spinal column, just crush under the weight as you pull this thing back, the <laughs> rotten meat peeling away. Warnak, so yep, flying one is dead on you, Mud. Vasily, you would be up. The only thing really left is this hand that's choking Lyle, but the window has not been covered. That's where the branch oh. came flying through, and you can see the other zombies have finished off most of their meal. You can just see the mostly cleaned corpse of this old woman outside, and they're slowly turning their attention to this open breach yeah. in your defenses. I have a feeling that Lyle could handle the hand, so I'm going to go over... And and try to grab, run over and grab a table and try to shove it up, lift it up and put it up over top of the window. Do anything I can to block that hole. All right, give me a strength challenge roll. Strength. Uh, Fifteen. Please. So yeah, you shove your way past Mud, who's in the doorway and over top of this dead zombie. Run across the floor. There's a couple of tables that are still there, so it's just a matter of rolling one over as you. Slam it up against this open window. You can hear the banging and the zombies on the other side almost instant. The moment you cover it up and it gives away under the weight. You're able to hold it for the time being, however. Um, Mud, you are up. So uh, everyone we know is still alive is in the room with us? Yes. Uh, well, since I took a fast action, that creature's not on me anymore. I will... Uh, Slam the door shut since I'm still in the doorway and kind of brace against it to uh, close up that gap. Um, that would be the doorway to the old man's room. If you look behind you before you shut the door, though, you can see they're slowly pulling away the window shutters for that room. So as you shut this door, it gives you at least a line of defense if they make it through. Um, you can take a move action if you want to move anywhere, or do you just want to hold that door for the time being? Um... No, I'll just hold the door. If we're closing up the windows and trying to seal up, I'll just hold the door for now. All right. <clears throat> and let's see if Lyle can get this zombie hand off of him. And he, he does. As he's pulling at this thing, he'll finally rip it free. And you can see he just takes what's left of this arm, this hand, and just swings it around and smashes it against the wall. You can see it drops down to the ground and fingers twitch a couple times and then lay still. That'll be the last zombie gone. As you hold this 
table up to the window, Vasily. You can feel him push in and pounding on the other side of it. Um, he needs somebody to nail it down or do something. But you can hold it for ten feet, not here. too long. Little help here. Ananda will look over at you, and then she just falls to her knees over top of Gelda, just We're weeping uncontrollably. Bester's in the corner, still screaming. Are we still on initiative order? Nope. Out of initiative, so go ahead and do whichever you guys want to do. I'll try to find the hammer and uh, pylons they were using and uh, try to get that shored up. Um, give me a perception roll. Ooh. Perception. Sex. In that case, you can see it across the way, sitting on top of the bars, the hammer spilled across the floor or a couple pittons. Um, Vasily, give me a strength challenge roll with one bane to hold it long enough for him to get those and get over to you. 12 minus 3 equals a 9. All right. So as you run across the floor mud, you grab this hammer, grab the couple of pittons, making your way. You can see Vasily holding it the best he can, but eventually it's just too much. And you can see this table tip forward into a small zombie. It looks like it was maybe a teenager-sized child at one time, climbs through the side window of the window, just in between the table and the wall before you're able to get that back up, Vasily. And it quickly scrabbles across the room and out the back door, like towards where the stables are. It, run, it doesn't attack as it just runs through towards... Well, that's weird. Sort of bestial, animal-like as it pulls its way through the window and down onto the floor and then scrabbles on all fours, past the bar and out back to the stables. There's something. Maybe they're headed towards the stables. Maybe there's something out there. We're next gonna gonna follow this teenage zombie. Sounds like a movie. <laughs> teenage zombies. Um, are you gonna nail that table up? Mud? Yeah. Yeah. So, so as you uh, hold it long enough, Mud or Vasily, besides that one, you're able to get that back up as Mud slams in a couple nails. You follow this thing out, Mornak, and get out to where the stables are. And you can just hear the screaming and whinnying of what sounds to be like a horse or pony, donkey, something that's in the stables. And this munching, gurgling sound. Um, give me a perception check. 17. All right. So as you come around the bar and peek through this. It's uh, sort of like a larger oak door that separates the main area from the stables outside. Open that up and look out. You can see 12 zombies that are all out there just feasting on the bodies of what were once horses, mules. And there's a whole cart um, that looks like it's been positioned out there that is full of old dried lumber and wood. It looks like they would use for like the cooking or the fireplace or whatever. And sitting on the edge of this cart, his legs dangling over the side, is this man. He has short cropped black hair, a nicely trimmed goatee. His ears are slightly pointed, not like an elf's. You can see he's not an elf, but also they're more pointy than a human's. What exactly? You're not sure. He wears these bright green plumed sort of pants, nicely polished black boots. A silken white shirt has this vest that comes down that's in this all sorts of rainbow sort of colors. A scarf around his neck, also an array of colors. All sorts of jewelry on his fingers, his hands, necklaces. And he sits there and sort of leans back against this pile of wood, clapping his fingers. Seeing you from the corner, he will smile. Didn't have a hat before, but as he reaches up, you see this hat on his head. It's sort of tips it towards you. Welcome, my friends, to the show that never ends. I hope you have fun. Snaps his fingers and he's gone. 
Mornak's going to run as fast as he can back into the inn. Are you leaving the door open? Yes. <laughs> All right. Okay. So you pull back in. You can see Bester has pulled himself over to where Ananda lies on the ground, or Gelda lies on the ground. Ananda and him just leaning over this dwarven woman's body, trying to console each other the best they can. They really don't say much, both of them weeping. Lyle has his back up against the wall, and he just stares blankly, sort of really nothing. And he takes a deep breath. He kind of rubs his throat where these bruises have formed, where this thing is choking him. They killed her. I should have done something. I, I, sh I should have. The flying branch, there wasn't much you could do. The... See, it's, he's actually talking about his mother, this old woman. Oh, Lyle. Okay, yeah, sorry. Okay. And he look over at you. I should have done something. I, I, I panicked. I, and he looks down at his sure hands. One hand is covered in blood, and this other one holds this knife that he was using to hack away at the zombie that was there. Just stares at his hands. He looks over at this blade. And then just plunges it straight into his chest. Let's see, falls onto the floor, his body convulsing a bit, this foam like blood spilling from his mouth. Mornak, when you went outside, did you see any path, any way that we could get, get away from here? Did I see anything like that, Morgan? Um, outside, it would have beyond where this cart was. It would have just been thick <coughs> fog. You really wouldn't have seen maybe a few <coughs> outlines of, of, of a tree in the distance, but nothing, nothing beyond that. No, it seems we're trapped here. There's a thick fog everywhere, and outside was a strange being who seemed to have a hat and not have a hat at the same time, and he was dressed in multiple colors with uh he, he, it was just very strange and he it, it's like he was telling us this was just the beginning are there any horses or anything out there that we could use to get away there there was a cart but no, I, I never saw any horses. I think they may be in the process of being eaten by the zombies. Oh, that's disconcerting. Nanda will sort of step up onto her feet, wipe her face off from this grime, a bit of blood and tears. And look over at all of you. This, this must be a nightmare. I, this this can't be. This can't be. This can't be. And she'll look over to where uh, the stable doors are. All of you can hear this sickening, crunching, slurping sound of the zombies feeding on the horses. The door hanging wide open still where Mornak left it. You know any place where we can go? This is your town. Just, just, but this is not a town. It's nothing but a tavern. We'd, perhaps we can get away in the darkness. I, beyond that, we'll have to make a stand. All around outside, you can hear the pounding fists on the walls, windows still breaking as the fingers come through the slats. It says, we can't stand to, to be here the entire night. They've already killed most of us. And there's how many of them? And she'll go over to one of the slatted things and try to peer through within range of not being grabbed and sort of looking out. This damn mist is just too thick to see what's out there. It's, what about the root cellar? There. What about the root cellar? We need to go outside for it. But it's one way in, one way out. There are some reminders for Chrissy and Kevin. We should go together as a group 
to the root cellar. Back to back, sword to sword. I'll, I'll go out and, and look outside the back door that's standing open and look around and see what I, I see out there. Is, does it look like we're being swarmed again from that, that side? You step out there, and that would be the area that leads out to the stables. Um, you can see this wagon, this cart full of wood and lumber and stuff that's more neck mentioned. You don't see this bean that you mentioned, though. Over at the stables, you can see 12 zombies just piled on the bodies of what look to be most of these horses half consumed. They're not as interested in you at the moment as they continue to feast. Um, glancing beyond that is just this thick, black, misty fog that covers the area. You can see movement in the fog, a lot of movement. But whether it's more people or zombies, or you can only assume. From every direction? There doesn't seem like there's... Okay. Yep. Almost like this fog is just rolled in all the way around this building. I do not like locking ourselves in a cellar. Best we just make a run for it. Well, there's shadows and movements in the darkness beyond in the woods in every direction. I, 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 and you see Bester sort of get up and he taps the floor a few times. I, I think I can get us out of here. Just have to follow me. Oh, do tell. Do tell. So, I, I put the, I, I put the little pony downstairs. Uh, if we could get to it, perhaps we can we can cross a, 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 a diversion from these these things and, and maybe make a clearing and, and just run, run run. I'm very fast. I, I can run very fast. A pony. It, 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 just a little. I, I, I named it Sarah. It's just my pet that that, that I kept down in the root cellar. I, 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 did, I didn't all, want. We can't all fit on a pony. Well, what if we feed it to the to the things out there and get them distracted to, so we can run past them? I'm very fast. It's better than dying here. The only thing I saw an advantage of the root cellar is that there's only one way in. Ananda shakes her head and I'm not leaving Gelda here. I will die here. If you make a run for it, I will hold them off as long as I can for you. I mean, if, if we see shadows in the woods from every direction, there's not really any place we can run to. We see movement in the in the fog all around i don't really see how trying to run is going to do anything there's movement in every direction in the fog that's surrounding this place what if we, we draw them to one side perhaps and, and then we run out the other maybe, maybe draw them out front and run out the back and if you if you can run fast like they like me, then we could maybe get away. They don't move very fast. Or we can try to get on top of the place. There's only a few of those winged ones. The rest of them I don't think could climb up to the top. Nanda nods. Hey, perhaps uh, we need to get up there somehow. Or there's an old ladder out in the storage shed. We could perhaps get. I'll look out the door again and see if I see any more of those winged ones. Uh, give me a perception roll. Uh, Nineteen plus one is dirty twenty. Um, yeah, there's a few here, and they don't look like there's very many, but you see one every now and then kind of flitter through the fog. Well, we, I think we have three choices. We can either Try to run for it and hope we don't get take get taken down out in the fog and the dark. I, I, I'm very fast. Or we can go to the roof or go to the root cellar. What does everyone else want to do? 
I, I, I think I, I, was, I think I'll run for it. I'm very fast. Well, I am not very fast. I'm in favor of this root cellar situation. What do I you just say, Mel? I'm in favor of moving forward instead of staying here. But Ananda looks around. Says, I'll gladly die here to <coughs> if it means that you can get away. Well, there's that. But I am not going to hide in a root cellar from these things. I plan to take as many as I can with me. I have nothing else to live for. My building is mostly gone, and my wife is dead. My, what else do I have? Well, Monarch, you want to ride on the, on the pony? She's a very fast pony, too. I can try riding the pony. Is it a white pony? No, 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 no. It's just a, 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 little, a little brown pony. Her name is Sarah. She's very fast. Like me, I'm very fast, too. Before we go, I'd like to... Uh, turn back towards that winged one that I was grappling with for a while and reach in to find that wooden knot that I see down its throat and rip that out as well. It's, you know, it kind of fits in this size, like almost like a um, billiard ball type size of just knotted wood in the craggy. It's this dark blackish red sort of color to it. I'll keep that for later. Well, I, I turn to the skittery little guys. All right, well, if you're fast, go. <coughs> oh, 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 okay. Uh, should, should, should we make a diversion? Should, 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 should I go, go get Sarah for, for, for your friend yeah. to ride? Yeah, let's go get, go get your pony. You see he skitters out to the kitchen area, and you can hear the creaking of the door and the banging of some stuff as he goes to get his small pony. I, I keep an eye to see if he gets swarmed out there. Um, it's, you see him go out to the kitchen and take a left and out this little side door and right around the corner, he pries it up. You can see these undead things shambling in the fog, getting closer and closer to him. He rips open this thing in a panic and stumbles down the steps. A moment passes, and then he hurries back out, leading this pony out of the root cellar up the steps. And he quickly comes around the corner and let's see if he makes it. He does. As he spins around the corner, he kind of moves just a little bit as a swipe of a claw comes through, and it grazes through this small pony's hair as he pulls in and slams the door shut. As he walks in with, like, a just a basic-sized pony, clipping, clopping across the floor, you can see these brown eyes and the thing looking around, sort of skittish. This, this is Sarah. Sarah, she's very fast. Would you like to ride her, Mr. Elf? I would. He climbs on top of the pony. It's, uh, it's kind of a, a bad fit for him because he's pretty tall, mm -hmm. and the pony is uh, not that big. Looks a little awkward, but it seems to support your weight, at least for the moment. Should, should we run? Or yeah. we run? Do we have, is, is there oil lamps, or is there anything like that around? Uh, yes, we've got plenty of oil lamps and oil down in the storage. If you're, if you're intent on staying here and drawing the diversion, you could set this place on fire. Maybe that might draw more towards it. it breaks my heart, but it's already been shattered. I... Indeed. If you all run as fast as you can, get out of here and promise me to protect this boy. I'll create the diversion you need. Sure. She'll look at you, her eyes squinting a bit. 
<clears throat> spits into her hand and holds it out to you, Wasumi. Shake on it. I look at it for a moment and begrudgingly I grasp her hand. He's not the smartest lad, but he can cook a good meal and it's fun to have around. Has a knack for dirty jokes, though. Just don't let him slip by you. She'll walk over and give Bester this huge hug and lifting the boy off the floor and setting him back down. Says, he better run, lad. Run like the wind. And with that, she'll go behind the bar and she takes out a couple of casks of oil and sets it up there. Takes out a torch and flint and lights up this torch once again. Says, give me time to spread the oil. We'll bring him around front. You better run. So while, while she's doing that, I'm going to use spell recovery. And I'm going to recover shadow dart. Okay. And I, I gain three points of health back. So I'm undamaged. Yeah, right. Anybody else do anything as she prepares? Yeah, I'm going to uh, use Wrath of Winter to heal up. Uh, my healing rate. Uh, and I'm also going to, uh, as we're preparing towards the door, uh, I'm going to grab Lyle. Okay. Uh, the one who stabbed himself. Mm -hmm. Just going to grab his corpse. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Toss him over your shoulder, football style? Pretty much. All right. So Lyle is with you. Not for long. <laughs> and Mornak, any last things you do before you ride like the wind on this pony? Um, no, I think I'm good to go. All right. Nando Nanda will walk around, cracks open these little casks of oil and spills it through the kitchen, through the stable area, before shutting those doors off through the back of the bar, down the hallways, leaving the main entrance area open enough. Then she goes to the back cooler area. You can see she just heaves out these chunks of meat, um, old steaks, hamburger, fowl, fish, and just begins hurling it out the window. As much as she has in there. Then she steps forward, strikes that flint, gets the torch, and lights the flames. You can see this oil just goes up in a rage of a flame down through the hallways, across the curtains, walls, through the back stables. Grabs her huge axe off the bar, moves forward, says, I'll run out there and start to swing in. You all run. Are you ready? All right, quick boy, lead the way. You're quick. You know these woods better than us. Yep, Lyle, or I'm sorry, uh, Bester will grab <laughs> his uh, torch off the bar, holds it up, just just in case uh, you, you can't see me, just, just follow the light. And he holds it up a bit. Ananda steps out, starts wading into this fog. You can hear the splattering of a zombie, another. Bits and limbs hitting the ground. She clears the way. Run! Hurry up, you fools, run! With that, Lyle, or I'm sorry, Bester, takes off running through this fog, holding his torch high. Its orange glow quickly starting to fade into the fog. I follow after with my very quick-stepped um, fawnish nature, but I'm still staying like a good 20 feet behind him. Okay. I'm not going to get too close to him, just in case things come swarming out of the dark towards that light. <laughs> All right. I kick the boy. pony into movement. <laughs> come on, come on. It gallops forward and trots along. It seems to sort of keep pace with uh, Vasily as you trudge along, but it looks around at these zombies as you pass by, and you can see hands sort of reaching through the fog to grasp at you in these towering fir and evergreen pine trees, those limbs scraping down, just scraping across your skin. Mud, you're the last one out the door. Do you run? Yep, running through, and then uh, 
if any start piling behind us or getting too close to one side or the other, I'm uh, giving them a while. All right. In the distance, um, the ceiling is you're sort of in the lead. You can see this orange glow of the torch ahead 20 feet, 25, 30, as he slowly but steadily begins to outpace you, even with your quick footed nature. Well, I, I just keep trying. Well, now I try to scramble and catch up to him. All right. Quickly running ahead, trying to keep up with this light. You spur your pony on. Behind you, mud, a little bit slower than the other two. It's within a few minutes, you realize you have to drop Lyle off as they're starting to kind of crowd in around you. But with his body on the ground behind you in a heap, the way clears once more as they feast on him and you're able to trudge ahead. And you can see this orange glow of Bester's torch slowly, steadily fading away. Keep pace the fast as you can, the ceiling, but it quickly outpaces you. And Mornak, if you spur your pony on, even if you move ahead of Vasily and stuff, it turns out that Bester is definitely fast as hell. He was not flying because he <laughs> disappears into this fog and you're left in darkness. This thick white fog just wrapping around you. Snakes around your ankles, around your bodies. And as you look around to one another, you can barely see each other in this thick, soupy mist. You can hear each other's breathing. And you're left alone in the darkness. The rain still continue to pour down. Thunder, lightning. What do you do? I just keep trying to go in the direction that I, of, of where he went. And Mornak, do you continue just to follow Vasily? Yeah. Yeah, I'll go ahead and stay with him. All right. And I assume you too, right, Mud? All right. You guys will trudge a couple minutes. You notice that the undead that were around are mostly gone. You don't have any grasping hands through the mists. Look around. These huge pine trees still loom over top of you, and you can just see their shadows in the fog. Just dead silence, five minutes, seven, eight. And eventually you're just gasping for breath. Not sure how long it's been, how far you might have traveled. As you look around, you're not even sure really which direction you came from. Uh, I just do the best of my ability to try to head in the same direction. Hopefully I'm not circling back around. All right. So as you guys begin to slower pace a little bit as you catch your breath and march through this fog, it just seems never-ending. Before long, I'm not quite sure how long, you can hear the howling of wolves in the distance. And that is where we shall end it this evening. Any last things you wish to do? Run. Right.